Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Unreal Results Podcast. Sometimes in between recording these, it feels like weeks, and then sometimes it feels like days, but most of the time it's just like a week, and it's just, time's funny, right? Time is, time is a funny thing. It is made a little bit made up. <laughs> Anyways, uh, welcome. And today I'm still in a little bit of like a brain hangover from this weekend. This weekend I had 20 um, amazing professionals in town here in San Diego for the in-person LTAP level one course so the locator test assessment protocol. And it was such an amazing weekend. Um, it was a blend. There was um, a lot of physical therapists, um, a couple athletic trainers, a couple massage therapists, and then a few Pilates or like yoga movement based professionals. And then of course, some of the physical therapists and massage therapists were also movement like Pilates based people too. So it's a little blend of everyone. Um, kind of cool. The whole course was women. And um, often I'd say, well, I've only, this is the second time I've done in person, but based on my online courses, based on my mentorship masterminds, based on my mentorship, um, it tends to be a little bit more women always than men. I'm not sure why that is. Um, but it always is a, it's just a different energy, um, in the room when it's all women and it was awesome. And also it, um, there was a quite a few hand quite a handful of pelvic physical therapists uh, there, so that was um, really cool as well. I always think when I think about it, um, this work in general tends to make sense for um, easily not well. It makes sense for everybody. Obviously, that's the whole point of this podcast is to. Uh, <laughs> point out that we should be considering the viscera and the nervous system in our musculoskeletal, uh, approaches. So, um, but it already makes sense to pelvic floor physical therapists because they're working internally. They're working with those organs, with people that are having pain or dysfunction or problems due to things that were going on with their viscera, whether that be uterus or prostate or bladder, um, rectum, all the things in the pelvis, right? So I tend to have quite a few pelvic floor physical therapy. People follow me and pay attention to what I'm saying because they're already sort of working in that world. So it's an easy um, crossover. It's an easy cell, I guess, to consider the other organs in the body and how they may influence pain in the other parts of the body. So anyways, um, it's really cool to, um, have them here though. And, um, yeah, it was, it's a two day course. So it's all hands-on and, um, yeah, teaching all day and just like holding space for people and, um, yeah, working. I don't, I mean, I don't know how many of you teach out there, but, um, it's, it's hosting a course is not, uh, um, not just like an easy walk in the park. It is 100% always worth it. Um, but it, but it's an energy drainer and yeah, your brain is like engaged the whole time. And, um, so it's been two days now and I'm, I'm, starting to like come out of the fog of it yesterday I was originally planning to record this yesterday and I was like there's no way there's no way I can get anything like you know if this, if this was orange juice and we were squeezing an orange there it there it 
there'd be nothing there. Um, so today I feel like I got a little bit to squeeze. I'm headed up to Sacramento for the Thanksgiving holiday um, a little bit later today uh, to see my sister and my nieces. And um, so I was like, all right, I got I got to do this whether I want to or not. Behind me, if you're watching on YouTube, you see I have a new addition to my office and I have some green. Um, my Monstera has gotten too big for the living room. And um, I was like, you know what? I think I should put it in the office. My office actually probably has the best lighting in the entire house for plants. Um, so it's kind of actually funny that I don't have plants in here. Uh, so I need to change that. So the Monstera is the first edition. I'm probably going to get a little, um, plant, a t like a small plant stand for it. So it'll still be like a floor plant, but it, a little bit taller. It was on a tall plant stand and it was way too big for that in the living room. But, um, I'm liking how it looks behind me. So we're going to keep that. Um, Anyways, uh, I guess we'll dive into it. So I was thinking about I, what I want to talk today, about today. And I actually have a running list of topics that last year when I started the podcast, um, well, almost a year ago, I wrote down like a whole 30 to 50 topics. Um, so I'm still working my way through some of those. But as a reminder, you can always request topics, you know, send me an email if you want, um, Anna, A-N-N-A, -N -N -A, at movementrev.com, or hit me up in the DMs on Instagram, and um, let me know what you want to hear about. Um, I'm happy to accommodate requests, and um, that's usually always what gets my brain going, because what I do is when somebody asks me a question, I have, I have an answer already in my head, but then I'm like, Ooh, let's learn more about it. So I open up my books and I read a little bit and I think of the things. So anyways, uh, we can get started. So I, I, when I opened up my list of things to talk about, one of the top ones was C-section and back pain. And, uh, since I had so many physical pelvic floor physical therapists in my class, I was like, you know what, let's talk about this because in class, even we talked a little bit about scars, but we didn't like really dive down the scar thing. So don't worry if you don't deal with anyone that has C-sections, any people that have C-sections or you don't have a C-section yourself. Um, this podcast is still going to be very applicable for you because it's going to be a little bit of like how I work with scars and then, um, how things are connected down in the lower abdominal area. So this might also apply for abdominal hernias, inguinal hernias, sports hernias, all the things down there. Um, so, but fundamentally, I kind of want to um, connect it into the C-section. So... <laughs> I'm like, where to start? I just dive right, right in. So C-section is the surgery to remove the baby from the uterus when it can't come through the birth canal. So the incision is in the lower abdomen. And the incision actually is right in the same spot that I would go to externally palpate the uterus. Makes sense, right? Um, and that spot is going to be just above the pubic bone. Oh, you know what? I've got a spying model here. Oop. We can see. So just about, here's the pubic bone. Just above the pubic bone, you run into like a little hump almost on the skin. And um, that's going to be the bladder. And then from the bladder hump, it you have a little divot. In that little divot, that's right where the uterus is. And it's in that little divot. Um, it also, so sometimes it follows like the line of, I mean, it kind of depends on what type of underwear you wear, but it's like where underwear kind of sit. If you have a, if you have some, a little bit of a belly, it's going to be like where the crease of your belly fat usually folds. Um, in fact, um, I have a belly <laughs> and I'm like, this is not a secret. If you've seen pictures of me, 
you've probably noticed. But what's interesting, sometimes in classes, people will assume that I had a C-section because I do have a skin fold crease right at that spot. And um, skin fold creases um, can look sometimes like a scar. Um, and it is exactly in that spot. So, um, but it's not. And um, what? how else would I... Um, tell you where the spot is I mean I that's like the best anatomical explanation of where it is it's sort of like if you took your pubic bone and your belly button it's um more just over if I'm going down from my belly button it's a little bit more than halfway to the pubic bone um but I w I wouldn't say I mean maybe three quarters just above three quarters but more than a half away uh, from the, the belly button to the pubic bone. So, um, and it's midline. So um, the uterus is a midline organ. The scar tends to be pretty midline depending on the situation. Sometimes the scar is a little longer or a little shorter. I think it probably just depends on the doctor, size of the baby, size of the person, situation, that kind of thing. I honestly actually don't know that much about the surgery itself because um, I this is I always tell people I'm like uh, unfortunately because I work with mainly professional athletes. Um, not that there are not women professional athletes, but they don't make the same amount of money as male men athletes, and so they are not typically the people I see. Um, I would love to see more female athletes. Shout out female athletes and professional athletes if, if you're out there and need support. Um, but the way that it is right now um, set up for me, how athletes fly me to see them and pay for my day, um, it's at a price point usually, unless they're local female athletes, it just doesn't, it's not so common. So I'd say that's what it is. It's not as common for female professional athletes to have the income to support their own personal staff like it is for men. So anyways, um, with that said, then the majority of my patient care population is males who um, or people who do not have a uterus. Um, and so and have never had a uterus. And um, I, there's not a whole lot of need for me to understand the C-section surgery itself, but I do understand the anatomy of that area and what's there, which is helpful. And, um, the, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, but what, when it comes to back pain and C-section, so it's fairly common. I mean, even after pregnancy, it's common for people to have back pain. But specifically, what I find interesting about the C-section scar and back pain is some a fun fact I learned from Philip Beach. So Philip Beach is the osteopath who wrote the book, Muscles and Meridians, The Manipulation of Shape. So he is an osteopath from New Zealand. And I started learning from him in 2014, so almost 10 years ago, which is crazy. And he's one of my favorite people, one of my favorite mentors. And um, his work that he presents in this book called The Contractile Field Theory of Movement, um, he introduces his movement model, which is a blend of um, embryology, evolutionary vertebrate biology and traditional Chinese medicine. And um, the interesting spot, the interesting thing about that is it then provides an understanding of this concept of borders um, and the borders of um, the different parts of our body that make up our shape, basically. And these borders are dictated by probably like anatomical folds in the fascia 
uh, embryological folds that were occurring during development, and he mapped them too using traditional Chinese medicine. And so we'll talk about sort of that concept, but what's interesting about this area of the C-section, this area um, where the uterus is located at that, it's on the anterior, you know, anterior um, part of the pelvis, a little bit more anterior, but in the midline. Um, And it is the border of the dorsal ventral field. So the dorsal ventral field, dorsal means back, ventral is front. So it's like in, in, in traditional anatomy, we think anterior, posterior. Well, our anterior body in our in anatomy is different than our ventral body from an embryological standpoint and a movement standpoint, actually. Like many animals, our ventral body is shorter or is smaller than our dorsal body. So if you think of a dog um, or whatever kind of animal on all fours, um, their back body, do you see how it's longer? than their front body. And we have that too. So the borders of our ventral body and our dorsal body is the top, it's the top of the, um, top of the cervical spine, base of the cranium here, um, at your nostrils, basically. That's the border. And then the other border down below is right there where the C-section scar is, right there at the uterus, that spot, like, not right above the pubic bone, but between the pubic bone and the belly button. Now, how to find the exact border is sort of like where the traditional Chinese medicine piece comes in. So these um, control points that come out of this traditional Chinese medicine, when they were mapping meridians back in the day, whenever that was, they were using like a, um, bigger than a fine filament needle, but they were using like a bigger poking item and like poking different areas of the body and seeing how the body responded. Well, every time you poke somewhere in the ventral body, poke, 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 in order to avoid that, I move into flexion. If you poke up here, I don't move into flexion because I would literally go into the poker. I move away from it. So dorsal body moves away from stuff moving into extension. Ventral body moves away from things moving into flexion. And so as you poke down the midline, there is a transition spot where instead of, and I'm going to stand up and show this, instead of moving away from the sharp poker into flexion, I, you get down into that spot of the pelvis. And as soon as I poke down there and Again, if I flex, I'm going to run into it, so I start extending. And so that is actually the transition of our front and back, our dorsal and ventral body. And it's right at that transition zone. So you can imagine the borders of the transition zones are pretty important parts of how we sort of link together or connect together in our tissues. And so more so than an incision, in the ventral body, or even an incision in the um, dorsal body, like a back surgery incision, an incision right there at the connection between the dorsal and ventral body just has a lot higher consequences to disrupting our general stability system and our movement patterns. Now, interesting enough, moving to, you know, how I said, like, even even though this this episode about C section and back pain, I said you know people who have had pregnancies, had babies, um, gone through even a vaginal birth, they have a lot of back pain too. Well, with this concept of the borders, the borders of the other fields, specifically the um helical field, the rotational field, and the lateral field, those cross as well at the perineal body. And the perineal body often is either surgically cut 
or ripped during vaginal birth as well. It's definitely obviously affected. So again, there's another border crossing there, which the consequences on the whole body are very significant. Um, but for the sake of talking about too much, we're just going to stick to the C-section because I think it's a very unique spot that people don't really consider that it's actually part of your back. So, and when it's part of your back, that means it's almost like you can imagine. So the muscles frontalis muscle, and then into your occipital muscles and your cervical spine, paraspinals and your thoracic paraspinals and your lumbar paraspinals, right? Your rector spinae wrap down through the thoracolumbar fascia, connect in with your pelvic floor, and then come up to that front lower abdominal part. So the pyramidalis and the lower part of your abdomen are actually back extensors. They're back muscles, they're extensors, they're dorsal body. And so it's, it's no surprise that we have such a disruption Um, when we have a disruption of part of that dorsal body where we, we influence the whole dorsal body, not even to mention when we talk about core container control and, um, you know, pressure maintenance and those things when it comes to core stability and back pain. You already know that you, you've already probably studied core container and stuff and back pain and that's thing. But, but maybe you have wondered why when you're doing the exercises that, you know, work to improve someone's core control, um, why it's not really always addressing their back pain all the way or, and, or you're not getting everything out of it that you are hoping for. Number one, there's a visceral component often because those um, core muscles, right, the muscles around our abdominal and pelvic floor and thoracic containers also surround the organs. So when the organs are not moving well, they're going to splint the organ and be focused on that more than actual core control. So there is a visceral piece just in general of why core control doesn't work. But then also there is a direct um, tissue, like scar tissue problem often with the tensioning of the entire back body because you've cut through it. So much like a scar, a back surgery scar on the thoracolumbar fascia could disrupt things from a mechanical standpoint, the stability, the strength, the control, pain, et cetera on our back body, you're getting that from the C-section scar too. So um, you better be all scars, but especially a C-section scar, then you better be addressing this from a tissue quality standpoint, a scar tissue quality standpoint of like where the scar is extending to on the inside of the body. And then, um, also from a sensory standpoint. So the the other connection here is that area of the abdomen where that scar is broke through, the cutaneous sensation of that area comes from the nerves actually way higher up on the back. And it comes from T12 and L1. So T12 anterior uh, cutaneous branch, uh, L1, which is hypogastric nerve, provides sensory to the skin there. And so, you know, thoracolumbar dysfunction or thoracolumbar movements or postural changes can also influence that area of the skin. And when the area of the skin cutaneous wise when we don't have very good information there, the motor control around the area is also going to be altered. So um, that's that's really important to, to um, keep in mind. Yeah, so it's anterior cutaneous branch of T12 and then the cutaneous branch of the hypogastric nerve that are right in that area of the lower abdomen. 
So sometimes not only doing the work on the scar, you'll need to go back up to the thoracolumbar junction and assess that. Because if the nerve root is compromised, right? If the nerve root's compromised, then any messages going to and from it are going to be compromised. So, you know, what's the, how are the facet joints moving in that area? How are the intercostals interacting in that area? You know, the, the diaphragm tendons are in that area. The psoas is in that area. Like what, all the things that are acting on those vertebral bodies, how are they related? Another interesting thing from a pelvic health standpoint is ovary, ovaries, ovaries, the ovaries have a suspensory ligament that go and connects to L1 as well. And so there is this other direct connection to the area of the nerve roots that's supplying that area with cutaneous function, but then also can be influenced by what's going on down there, right? Because the the odor, the ovaries, though they are sort of not attached to the uterus itself, right? They're they're separate. They're they're kind of I kind of like to think of them as like floating next to the fallopian tubes, but the they are invested, suspended in the broad ligament that goes over the uterus and goes to the sides of the pelvis. So the broad uterus, if you've ever seen it, it looks to me, it looks like big elephant ears. So that is one of the suspensory ligaments to the ovary, as well as the round ligament that connects the um, uterus, to the front of the pelvic bowl that also has an extension to the ovary. So you have the ovary suspended by the round ligament, the broad ligament, and then the suspensory ligament that goes up all the way to the thoracolumbar junction all the way to the diaphragm. So if you have any torsion or tension on those ligaments from the scar tissue of the C-section, which is very common, then it can alter the mechanics at the thoracolumbar junction, which then further changes the cutaneous information in that area, which then cascades into problems. Not to mention that means that you can, that back pain, it might not be low back pain. It might be mid back pain because of these torsions. So you also have to, in your evaluation with someone with back pain, you have to like really be clear on where their back pain is and, and where it's coming from. Um, and again, going back to the connections to the core container, when we have altered mechanics around the thoracolumbar junction, that's going to change our core container pressure control a lot because of that's where right the di- where the diaphragm is, right? So people who cannot, you know, bring their thoracolumbar f- junction into flexion um, will, are going to have a hard time creating great pressures for um, good intra-abdominal control, right? And it can be a bigger picture than just beating yourself over the head with exercises and diaphragm stuff and stability exercises. It can be coming back from the C-section. It can be coming back from the organs itself. Not to mention, and this is like, this is looking at it from a just purely the organs that are involved in the actual um, piece of the c-section and birth and that kind of thing not to mention all the other things that can be affected right because when 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 uh, the baby starts growing and the uterus starts getting bigger everything gets kind of pushed in different directions so you can have organ visceral referral patterns and visceral mobility issues at different organs because of this same thing even with the c-section scar the scar, the extension of the scar tissue into the body can be anywhere. It It is not directly under the scar. The way scars heal, it, there is like no rhyme or reason to the direction they go, right? And so you can have adhesions from the scar extend to different organs in different parts of the peritoneum. Um, and 
it's it's not just the uterus. It's not just the uterus. And even then, whenever you introduce air into the abdominal cavity or the pelvic ca cavity, the air actually starts to dry out the serous membrane and the tissues. And then that creates some adhesions as well. So it, they can be anywhere. But we're, you know, I'm, I'm trying to give you a picture of the anatomy and how it would relate um, in a more black and white scenario. But it, it really can be anywhere. So um, with that said, you know, so I, I, I told you how that area of the body is a transition zone between our dorsal body and our ventral body. Um, I explained how that's mapped and how it's just as disruptive to our back musculature, musculature and control as our as a scar on our back would be. Um, and then I talk about the connection to the thoracolumbar fascia, both from a, a nerve, sensory nerve standpoint of the area of the body, as well as a connection of the suspensory ligaments. Um, and a little bit about the core container piece of it. And now let's talk about the scar itself. So like, what do you do? So first, first of all, there's, there's sort of two things about the scar. One is restoring the cutaneous information around that area. Because when you cut through the skin, you cut through those cutaneous nerves and we need to restore that. That exteroceptive information is really important for our brain mapping our body. And so we want to improve that now blurry spot of the map in our brain. You do that by touch. You do that by touch of different textures. So yes, of course, the first thing you can use is your hands or your patient can use their hands, but then different clothing textures, different towels. So I love using a hand towel. Usually a traditional terry cloth hand towel has one side that's smooth and one side that's rough. So you can use either side of that. You can lift the skin and roll it in those textures. You can use really any anything that seems like it's a different texture is worth experiencing in that area. The more different textures and temperatures we can provide the skin, the more we map it, right? And so you can even use an ice cube or like something warm, right? So if you have one of the things that would be nice, if you have those um, globes, like the globes that you can either cool or heat up for facials, you can actually use that in the area too for the different temperatures. So temperatures, textures um, are really good things for improving cutaneous information and more is better. And I usually, people are always asking me, well, for how long? And I'm like, is just do it until it's not interesting anymore. It will be an interesting experience for people. So that's the first thing, restoring that cutaneous information. And um, it would be worth exploring, even though the cutaneous nerves from the area I told you are just in that spot, because it is um, part of our back body, any experience of sensory information throughout our back body would be helpful for it as well. Um, so, you know, this is kind of where I even like, like the laying on the, um, those like acupressure mats, those spiky mats, this might be a good thing to explore, or again, just experiencing different textures on your back. And really how often are you doing that anyways? Right? Like I think about like, does my back experience any different textures on a regular basis? Not really. Maybe if I go to the beach and lay in the sand. But even then, it's often I have clothes on. So something to think about. Um, then it's the scar itself from more of a mobility standpoint. And the scar itself from a mobility standpoint, let's talk about that. So the interesting thing is I'm going to draw like a fake scar on my arm so you can, so I can demonstrate it. So again, if you're not watching on YouTube, then you're just going to have to trust me on what I'm saying. But um, if you're in the car listening or on a walk or something listening, maybe just um, take a screenshot of the minute mark on this and uh, go watch it on YouTube. But um, I want to talk about the scar. So one of the one of the tests that we do in the LTAP 
are um, inhibition tests. And inhibition tests are basically just like seeing how a structure is influencing the musculoskeletal or vascular system by um, doing some sort of assessment, touching that structure, and then reassessing and see if it changes. So uh, you can do this with a scar. So let's say you want to say, want to see how much the scar or this cutaneous area even is involved in the lack of motor control around the body. So in this instance, maybe you're having them lay down on the table on their back and do a just small straight leg raise. I just tell people lift your leg like two inches off the ground and you're looking at their pelvic control. This is a traditional, like most of the time when people see this, right? If you lift your leg up and your whole pelvis tips to the side, traditional sports medicine will tell you, or traditional physical therapy, however you want to think about it, um, will be like, oh, your core control is lacking and like you need to do a big exhale breath and recruit the oblique muscles and your transverse abdominis to prevent the, t- the pelvis from tipping to the side. I'm like, mm, that's not true. Um you have to be pretty weak to not be able to lift the weight of your leg well. And usually that's just a sign of the organization of your body is organized around probably something more important, right? The muscles are busy protecting something else. Or the muscles don't have the full amount of information in the brain to organize themselves well, right? The sensory input going in the brain is not clear, for the body to organize itself in a way that controls the core to lift the leg up. So then you're going to put your finger on different parts. You can do the whole scar. So sometimes I just do the whole scar first. So if you see the scar on my arm, I, and you're imagining this is my C-section scar, I'm going to put my hand just on the scar and be like, I'm on your scar. And then I'm going to have them repeat the leg lift. And if the leg lift improves, then guess what's influencing that organization of the body to lift the leg? The scar is. So now I want to get specific with what part of the scar. Is it all the scar? Is it a certain part? So then I'm going to go start on one edge and I'm going to go one finger at a time around the scar. And what you'll probably find is there's one area of the scar is probably influencing it more than the others. And you might even notice that maybe the area that it is is like a little denser. Maybe it's not. I don't know. We, I don't know until I test. I can't assume like a chelated part of the scar or a denser or more stuck with the skin part of the scar is influencing their body in an adverse way unless I test it. And so we test it. Then let's say we find an area. So let's say we find an area right here on the scar. And we're like, wow, that is like a magic button. When I push right there and then have them do the leg lifts, the leg lifts perfect. And they feel great, right? Maybe they don't even have any back pain anymore. Wonderful. So then I'm going to do treatment in that area. And I'm going to do a couple things. One, I'm going to try to feel, does it feel like this goes deep? right? Does I, do I feel like it's pulling me into their body? There might be a connection to one of those suspensory ligaments or the peritoneum. If that's the case, then I might be doing work a little deeper, but then I might use my other hand and connect to different areas where those containers reach the hard frame. So like, let's say it's connected to the broad ligament then I would test that or I would experience that connection. My other hand would would connect to like the side of the um, ilium and sort of bring it closer to the scar. And maybe as soon as I do that, I notice it change tension under my hands. Or maybe it's more to the posterior part of the peritoneum or the retro or even retro peritoneum. And I, so I slide my hand under their back and I, um, press on to like the sacrum and I feel, oh, that changes the scar too. And so I want to see like, is it connected to anything? So I'm just going to put my hand on different parts of the hard frame that I know there's a connection to. Maybe there is a suspensory ligament thing to the L1. So I'm going to go all the way up to L1 and see, does this change how it feels under my hand on the scar? If it does, then when you do scar work, I'd keep the other hand there right? Because we're wanting to bring them together. So um, that's the first thing. 
And then, then once I'm like in the right connection, what, once I've got my pieces together, I can test the skin or the range of motion of the tissue in all the directions. How well does it go that way? In the other way, and to the right, to the left, up, down, twist it like a clock. Does it go easy? Whichever way it goes the easiest, I'm going to actually start my scar tissue mobilization in that direction. Going with the body, going into the direction of ease is usually going to take me to the tension. If that doesn't make sense, think about a knot. If something is knotted, like if I knot my t-shirt up here on the right and I have my hand over on the left and I pull away from the knot, which is going into the tension, am I going to ever find the original adhesion spot, the original knot? No, I'm just going to make it tighter and more uncomfortable for the person. So I'm actually going to the knot and I'm trying to find that and I'm trying to work there. And when you do that, you'll start to notice the, the density of the tissue change under your hands. And then you'll stop for a second and then you'll reassess the directions again. And you'll just keep doing that until all the directions feel really free. And you'll do that along the whole scar. And then I might do the same thing by lifting the scar. So now I'm going to lift the skin and I'm going to test everything around that scar all the directions, and I'm going to do it. So I'm going to do it with compression. I'm going to do it with decompression or a skin lift. You're going to restore it as best as you can and then retest everything. More than likely, you're going to see a change, especially if in the inhibition tests, you notice there, there was a big change. So that's how you work the scar. And guess what? You can't, it's not just once you work the scar, you are ha you're going to have to do it a lot for a long time because it the scar is constantly changing right this is not like in this is not like after the scar heals and like 21 days later it's good no i scars are continually changing and even old scars you can make a difference in it just takes a while but every time you go back to it it's going to offer you a different sort of line of tension to free up and the thing about scar tissue is you're not going to ever eliminate the scar tissue. The goal is to make that scar tissue mobile and allow that scar tissue to sort of be integrated into the system in the best way possible. But, I, but also scar tissue is not the same as like the literal tissue is not the same as the tissue that was once there before. It has a different quality to it. So it's always going to be a point that sort of things organize itself around and get stuck around and have potential to drive dysfunction. So this is why, too, you need to teach your people how to take care of their scars because this is a lifelong thing. Their scar will be the, with them forever and it will change and um, affect them forever. And so we want to continue to allow them to explore all the things that the scar needs. So, oh, with that said too, as I said that, it reminded me one of the other great textures I use with the textures besides the towels and the fabric is the gorgeous ball. The gorgeous ball is a really unique texture and it sort of grabs the skin really well. So doing work with the gorgeous ball can be really helpful along the scars too. And you're not laying on it. You're using it as, as an extension of your hand, right? You're using it to stretch the skin and experience a different texture in that area of the body. So, whew, 40, 43 minutes. I, I told you, I felt like I had something in my brain to give today. I just had to get started. <laughs> So anyways, I hope that was helpful for you, both in understanding a little bit about um, the connections of the body, the embryology, um, the importance of that area of the body, and then also how to work with scars. So um, if C-sections are like, I'm not interested, at least hopefully you understand how to work with a scar because this is how I work with scars anywhere on the body, anywhere any scar. Thank you for being here. This uh, podcast episode comes out the day before Thanksgiving in the United States. So happy Thanksgiving to those of you listening in the United States. 
um, everyone else, just happy Wednesday. And oh, also, if you are listening on the day this comes out, I announced the um, I announced the date for the next in-person course of the LTAP and location. It's going to be in Phoenix, Arizona, April 6th and 7th, 2024. And if you catch this today and you know you're in, um, I'm doing a flash sale as I announced it. And the flash sale ends the end of day today, Wednesday, November 22nd. So $400 off on the bundle or $200 off the course. If you missed it, don't worry. The course, the in-person course, will still have an early bird discount up until a month before the course. Uh, so I hope to see you there. Uh, also, um, all the sales, it's Black Friday coming up um, in the United States. And so I have a Black Friday sale starting on Friday, Black Friday, uh, November 24th, running until end of the day, Monday, November 27th. And it is 40 to 50% off all of, not all of, yeah, not all of them but 40 to 50% off um, most of the online self-paced education and my region library. And I'm doing a bundle, a treatment bundle, specifically a bundle of the um, online courses related to treatment. So if you haven't gotten some of those courses, this is your chance to get them at a discount. It's going to be the Swelling Reduction online course, the Nerve Workshop with me and Missy Bunch, the Never Treat the Shoulder First workshop, the, I feel like there's another, oh, the results. The Results Cheat Code online course will only be available as an add-on to the treatment bundle this round. And then the other thing is the Regen Library and all the individual Regen sessions are on sale as well. So I don't think I'm missing one, but maybe I am. Either way, I um, will have the link linked on my um, Instagram page. If you're on my email list, you'll get the link. I'll also tell it to you right now and link it in the show notes. But my general links email or uh, website address is www movementrev.com forward slash links dash i g so links l i n k s dash i g so it will be there as well uh that's it have a great day thank you for being here and i'll talk to you next week